that's the answer. There's no silver bullet to marketing. There's no silver bullet to development. Um, it is really taking the care and the time together. And we're, we're clear with our posts, like this will be hard. This will be complicated. There will be a moment in time where you're like regretting every life decision you ever made that led you to the moment that you knew us at Lemonada. And then you will get to the other side and you will be extremely happy and proud. This is Podcast Perspectives, a show about the latest news in the podcast industry and the people behind it. I'm your host, Jeff Umbro, founder and CEO of The Podglomerate. Joining me today is Jessica Cordova-Kramer, CEO and co-founder of Lemonada Media. Lemonada is known as a hit maker with shows like Last Day, Believe Her, Wiser Than Me with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and one of their latest titles, The Doe with X Mayo. We dive into how Lemonada approaches narrative productions as well as celebrity-driven shows, what it means to be an audio first network and how Jess feels about the current state of the industry. Let's get right to it. Welcome to the show, Jess. Thanks, Jess. You, I I interviewed you guys in 2019 when you launched the the network. Um, You had just launched the last day. Uh, Great show, still around doing, you know, awesome good in the world and entertaining people as well. Um, but I, I wanted to ask, I think I might've asked this question back in 2019, but why start a company in a network as opposed to starting just a podcast? It's such a great question. I, it, we sometimes ask ourselves that on a regular basis. Um, why didn't we just launch one show and leave it at that? Um, the truth is we were putting last day out there and um, pitching it out, trying to get a network to, to take us. Still waiting to hear back. It's been four years. Uh, <laughs> be nice if someone would get back to me. But we, you know, I was, I was at Crooked at the time and I had been there from day zero. And so I'd seen a company put more and more content out. And I said to Steph, what if we did it ourselves? And as we were making last day, we were like, man, there is so much bad stuff that we could be talking about that could help people in our, you know, sort of comedic, thoughtful way. Um, And so we just started to think, let's go bigger. Um, Let's put last day out, but let's have it be part of a slate. Let's have it be part of a company we thought a small company that we own things have gone much more quickly than we expected um but that was the sort of genealogy of lemonado we thought this was our barrel of lemons but lots of people are struggling out there and um what if we had content that helped get people out of the bed in the morning at scale and so fast forward to today which is four years later in a nutshell how is everything going every single day is incredible and challenging it is like uh, I mean, any kind of startup is going to feel this way. And then we're in the space of both content. So we're working with creators and also really heavy content sometimes and other times comedic. Um, it is incredible. Um, the business is thriving and growing, but also every day is a new challenge. And we've also been, it was 2019 when we launched September and now it's October, 2023. It's been four years in the broader world that has been completely wild like elections and covid and wars and you name it um financial crises so we're we're both trying to make beautiful podcasts that lots and lots of people listen to with incredible talented diverse people in this environment so you know sometimes people make jokes about white knuckling and we have very white (laughs) knuckles um but we have an amazing team We, we love it uh but i'm never like oh my god it's so great it's so great i'm like cool this is this is a lot of work. And, you know, launching shows is a lot of work. We're like, um, every single show is our baby. We have put mountains of effort into it. Um, even our sales and distribution partners, we we care deeply about folks. We only bring people on the network who feel like a mission aligned and like this, we, we can sell your show or whatever, we can distribute it well. Um, so we, we care, care, care deeply. Um, and, you know, it takes a mountain of work to launch one show. So yeah yeah it's going it's going well we are tired i've covered up a lot of my gray hairs for this recording but we feel like good about what we're doing you know pop out of bed kind of like i know what i'm here to do and that feels good too i love it and i totally get the white knuckling that doesn't seem (laughs) to go away uh you mentioned you have sales and distribution partners uh and then you know as opposed to your original shows what's the general breakdown of of that i don't know the exact number off the top of my head but I think it's about 
seven to 10 sales and distribution partners compared to a slate of, of we'll have about 50 shows on the network altogether. Um, so it's a small percentage of our portfolio that are partners who make their own content, but we're working with them to distribute it, monetize it in some, in some ways, market it as well. Um, uh, and that, that number will grow. I don't know if the percentage will grow um, over time, but there's so many incredible creators out there who are like, my stuff would be amazing on your network. And we're like, we agree and we can sell the crap out of it. So let's go. And you have expanded quite a bit. You, you know, you literally started with the one show. You're now at 50 plus. Sounds like almost 60 if you include like the, you know, sales and distro partners. Well, and it will be at 50 at the end of the year. So um, including sales and distro. Got it. That's a lot. Uh, how a lot. do <laughs> How do you scale without sacrificing quality? You need incredible people. Our, our, our team is mostly made up of wonderful human beings who share core values with each other. Um, our core values are mission aligned, honest, and empathetic. Um, so those are the things that we are looking for in staff. We've got about uh, 55, 56 full-time staff members now. Uh, the bulk of that are on the production engineering side. And then we have our it's a full suite network. So we've got a marketing department, finance, operations, um, sales, and development. Um, we've sort of got it all in-house. And um, that is the kind of care we take with each show. Um, so it's really about people and paying attention. And I would, I'd like to say not taking, not biting off more than you can chew, but um, we're definitely doing that uh, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's a real, it's really about the people and making sure you have the resources for them, for each other um, to do the work. And then for talent, because we work with people we care about and we want to make sure that their show is getting the attention that it deserves too. And in terms of biting off more than you can chew, like I know that you guys have, have expanded a lot and have done a lot of cool things, but it still feels from to me as an outsider that you're very thoughtful about everything that you do in the shows that you choose to work with and how you put them out in the world. Um, so just a note to say that it shows. Thank you. So you also work with quite a few celebrity or you know well-known talents. Uh, we're in a point in the industry where a lot of celebrity deals really seemingly have not gone well. Uh, so how do you approach the idea of working with somebody like a Julia Louis Dreyfus uh, and like doing the show justice, but also putting out something that is meaningful as opposed to just a name? Yeah. With any of our podcasts, there's a few things that really need to be true before we either make them ourselves, <clears throat> find a host, or we you know bring a host onto the network to make it together. And it has to be on brand. And for us, that means it has to make life suck less in some way. So a million things could fall under that category, but some things really don't. And so it's very clear where you're like, this is super amazing and super entertaining and not for us. Um, so that that's like a sort of easy clearing house. And then, you know, Make Life Suck Less, we have, we have big, huge, sweeping narrative series on topics. We have shows like Last Day that are human centered, but covering big issues or talking with people now. Um, we've got um, comedy. We've got brand new business show called The Doe that I'm really excited about that's about women in finance, but it's hosted by a comedian. So all of these things make life suck less. And that is a clear uniter. And even with our ad sales and distro deals, we're working with folks like Kate Bowler and everything happens. Like if we had existed before, we might've had that show on the network to begin with. It is a perfect fit for Lemonada. Jose Andres, Megan Trainer, like th these people are, are making podcasts that are squarely meant to help people in some way. So that that part's easy for us and our it's not me and Stephanie and my co-founder Stephanie Wills Wax who runs our production team. If you if you think our show quality is high, it's her, not me. She's the one who makes those shows every single day with our incredible production team, Steve Nelson, Jackie Danziger, and and um, many other wonderful people. Um, but you know when it when it comes to making sure that the shows are high quality. Um, and on brand, it's not just us. We have, and we have a pitch advisory committee from our staff that's reviewing pitches. We have like all these wonderful things that happen so that we can be like, this is like really good fit for us, or maybe this we're not the best network for this. Um, so very collaborative decision making at Lemonada. Then when it comes to talent, like Julia, look, I mean, 
She's Julia Louis Dreyfus. <laughs> we are the luckiest people alive. I wake up every morning and I pinch myself that I get to know this woman, collaborate with this woman, create a, a hit, hit, hit show with this woman. Um, and she's an incredible talent, but she was looking for a network. She had a, a, an idea about talking to older women because she felt like they hadn't gotten the platform that they deserved after living remarkable lives. Um, and we believed in that vision and she wanted a team that could actually help her bring it to life in a really beautiful way. And so for us working with celebrities, talent, well-known individuals, whatever you want to, however you want to label it is like, is there an authenticity and passion there? Is there something, is there a core idea that hasn't been done yet in this particular way? Um, and if you can find that space and make a beautiful show, it's, it's, it's going to be a hit. Um, so we're just, you know, thoughtful is probably the short answer to your question. So I have two threads that I want to follow from that. Uh, one is, uh, talking through like kind of the process of how you take a, maybe, you know, Julia or someone else comes to you with an idea. Like, how do you sit down and actually dissect this and figure out what you need to do to make this a success? And I know every show is a little different, but like, do you start with the idea, the producer, the research, the writing, like what comes first and then how do you develop that? And the second thread, which we can get to after is, um, what other like celebrity driven shows do you feel outside of Lemonada are doing really well right now and why? My answer is so frustratingly the same for everything at Lemonada. It's true for marketing. Like I said on a lot of panels, Lizzie Fire Bowman does too around like, how do you launch a show? It is a million little things done well. And I'm sorry to disappoint you about this answer. No, you no, that's, do... that's a great answer. <laughs> it's that's what, that's the answer. There's no silver bullet to marketing. There's no silver bullet to development. Um, it is really taking the care and the time together. And we're, we're clear with our hosts, like this will be hard. This will be complicated. There will be a moment in time where you're like, regretting every life decision you ever made that led you to the moment that you knew us at Lemonada. And then you will get to the other side and you will be extremely happy and proud um, because we're, we, we do take care um, of, of people and even ad rates um, are beautiful and we, they're content. And if, you know, Sam B is reading a hair product ad, like we care about Sam, we care about her reputation, we care about what the audience is hearing, and we really care about our brands too. Um, and I think they feel it. So it is a truly a million little things done well. We have a development team um, for both our weekly and narrative slates that take care and time on the front end to really dig into what a show format will be. Um, we always think about what episode 65 is going to sound like, not episode one. Um, like, is this something you could actually keep doing, want to keep doing on the weekly side? Uh, we think about story and story arc really detailed on the narrative side. Um, so it is unfortunately just very hard. Um, and we have incredible people. And yeah, we always think about like, what's the right mix of producers and engineers and um, who's the right person to help bring this talent, you know, to the fore every day and feel like they're a good fit. And Stephanie is a genius. That's the other thing. Yeah. Like I always say I'm the fuel, but she's the fire. Um, I'm the one who's making sure we have the resources and the infrastructure and the, all the boring shit. Um, I get to talk to you. That's like the highlight, but I love it. Yeah. You know, I, I operate as a CEO. She operates as the C chief creative officer and I have big picture vision stuff all the time, but she is like the most de detail oriented creator producer and can really work with all kinds of people. I call her the talent whisperer. Um, your second question about other shows that have broken through and the celebrity side. I mean, obviously there's smart lists and I'm a fan. And I think any shows where you have notable voices and they are operating as if they are your friends, you know, it's like it, they're funny. I can put it on at the gym. The banter is good. The interviews are good. It's a simple formula, repeatable, very clear what episode 65 is going to be. They seem to enjoy doing it. And so you just feel like you're sitting around with them and you're not getting, you're getting the celebrity. I mean, part of why the show is so funny is you get the like behind the scenes of what life is like um, for, for these guys. And it's by the way, great. Um, but you're getting like a little bit of inside stuff and their, their, their chemistry is wonderful. Um, so it checks all the boxes for um, everything other than like, you know, maybe form. I mean, it's just three, three guys who are celebrities who are friends talking. If, if I, if I pitched that to you, you'd be like, eh. 
Yeah, that doesn't sound great. Um, yeah, but it, but it is great. Yeah. Um, and then and then there's like I mean Amy Poehler's new show was excite was exciting to me. I, mockumentary is my favorite form of art by far. Um, and I got a chance to listen, and I think they do a great job improvising. And um, it's it's at number one in comedy right now. And um, I'm not sure anyone else could have pulled that off, but Amy, and it's fantastic. So. It- Wiser Than Me was a, I think you said hit three times when I asked you about it before. Um, it is uh, a phenomenal show and it is uh, actually having like a lasting retained listenership, which is not always the case with celebrity driven shows. Uh, how did you approach the marketing for that show uh, in order to kind of unlock that kind of success? Okay. We have a recipe for hit shows and we followed it with Wiser Than Me and we have a mega hit and we've had a few mega hits. Um, this one, you know, this one is, it's Julia Louis-Dreyfus. She's, there's so few people whose voice you could put on with no context and be like, that's Julia Louis-Dreyfus. You know, there's like Barack <laughs> Obama. We, we did that. We did the inventory. We're like, it's like Barack Obama. You know, his voice, probably the last few presidents and Julia and maybe like six other people um, where you'd be like, I know who that is. Yeah. So there's, that was, there's just some magic there. And we've had a lot of number ones. This is not our first number one. Um, but it was sustained for the longest period of time. And yeah, you're right. It's still it's still top comedy and it's still top 100 or 200 every week. And, and just to just to clarify, you all have had a lot of success and and I'm not minimizing any of that. But this one in particular did stand out. No, no. This was Vic. This is a mega hit. Yeah. Um, and, and there's only so much you can do to control that. We knew we, we, we knew we were going to make a hit show. No question we were going to hit number one. No question it was going to have millions and millions of downloads. Like we had a marketing plan. We had a plan with our marketing plan includes all of the Spotify work and all of the Apple work and all of the Amazon music work and all of the other partnerships with other platforms, editorial, PR, earned media, you name it. So we had our recipe um, and we followed it uh, with fidelity and um, there's no accounting for word of mouth. It is the secret sauce that will get, you know, we people would tell us that they were like standing in the grocery line and two women would be talking about wiser than me. Um, if I go to a party and I, there's a bunch of middle-aged ladies there, which is the only party I will go to. And I'm like, <laughs> Hey, I produce wiser than me, which I would never do. People would be like, Oh, you produce wiser than me. I mean, it is like, a, it's a thing people are talking about at yoga studios. It's a yeah. thing people are talking about at cocktail parties. And you cannot make that happen no matter what you do. The only way you can make that happen is to market a great show well, and then pray. Um, and it is, it is a phenomenon in that way. Step one of any marketing campaign is making a good show. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about sponsorships because you have, uh, you have the model that everybody thinks that they're going to have when they get into podcasting, but nobody can actually achieve it, but you guys did it and you're continuing to do it where you're able to, uh, in many cases anyway, find like a partnership uh to sponsor the show like a grant or an an organization that wants to be attached to something that you're producing as opposed to like a dr brand who's sponsoring like a hundred thousand impressions on the show or something i know you have both but um you've been very successful in building more of a partnership with different orgs as opposed to like a sales department uh how do you go about doing that Rewinding a little bit, we do ha- now have sales fully, completely internal, and we have a sales department led by CC Donbrain. We're hiring um, for two two positions, two salespeople right now. So uh, we, um, in the beginning, had ad sales and distribution partners um, first with Cumulus and then with Midroll, and they were wonderful partners. And during the time that we had them um, managing our our sales, we started to understand that part of the business more and thought we could probably do this better ourselves without having to share any revenue. And so in May, 2021, we took sales in-house. We do, we've had a real sales team since then. It's not huge, but we've had a real sales team since then. Um, and we also do some partnerships with nonprofits and foundations as you referenced, but it is a pretty small potential uh, percentage of our pie relative to brand direct relationships and also um, agency relationships. So we have a full sales team um, and they are working just like any sales team you would have at iHeart or, um, you know, wherever, uh, ACAST, any other 
any other place. Um, and they do sometimes work with foundations and sponsors um, who we, we, can, we call partners um, on um, helping us as sponsors pre-fund big, huge sweeping narratives that are quite expensive to make. And then there are sponsors on that show. Um, so we've worked with incredible organizations like the Jed Foundation, Marguerite Casey Foundation, um, and others on our shows to make some of them happen. And they're incredible, but our, the vast majority of our revenue is more standard than you'd expect. And our sales team is killing it. We love them. That's why we're able to have ad sales and distro partners because we're not usually finding foundation nonprofit partners for other shows. They're just reading standard ads um, for the most part. So that's a, a good clarification. Um, because, you know, the Jed Foundation, for example, is like kind of front and center on some of your shows or, or one of your shows, right? One, yeah. One yeah. right now, but they've done, we've had like a bunch of different partnerships with them over the years. But it sounds like that's more of a situation where it's like they're almost, and, you know, they're partners, but they're almost like funding the initial production of the show, in which case then it kind of follows the standard roadmap of like selling sponsorship and sales and such. Yep. All sponsorship. Exactly. So you guys specifically call yourselves an audio first network. Uh, what does that mean? It means the thing that we say we're good at is making podcasts, um, making audio podcasts. We are not a video production house. We're not pretending to be. We don't um, usually like if, if incredible show comes to us and it's like, you think this is a webcast? We're like, we do not have the skills to pay the bills on that. We just don't. I mean, we could do Riverside like you're doing right now. We use Zoom all the time as well. Um, for Sarah Silverman's show, we've got some nice video cameras in the studio for her so we can collect clips at the caliber that she's used to them. Um, but ultimately, our bread and butter and our skill set is audio production. If you're an audio producer, you're a freaking audio producer. You're not a video producer. Even the editing is different. So uh -huh. we're just really clear about that and every three to six months we at our executive level are having a conversation about is this the time that we're building video capabilities and at this point we have not decided to do that because the infrastructure for distribution monetization and all of that is just not where it needs to be for us to efficiently make video um a big part of our our work so we are audio first and we it's it's just nice to be focused you know um, and a lot of our talent, like they're signing up to be on a podcast. They're not signing up to be on a webcast and they don't want to be videoed. We're talking about hard stuff. So people are like openly weeping or, um, with Julia's show, she's like, I don't want these ladies to have to do hair and makeup to come on and talk to me about aging. Um, so we, we, you know, that's part of our, our core business is being clear about what we're good at. Yeah. We, uh, full disclosure, this show in particular is meant to be that experiment for us to see exactly like what does need to go into it. Um, there are many, many shows that we produce that will never be on video. Uh, so I'm totally aligned with everything that you're saying. Uh, I do think it's an interesting distinction as you start to move into other areas like the Lemonada Book Club and, uh, you know, a few other things that you all are doing. I assume that there's at some point in some way, like some kind of derivative IP situation happening. But yeah, I, I agree with your, your assessment there. I think that it is a completely different beast in order to like work on video or other like platforms as opposed to audio. Um, on that note, with the uh, Lemonada Book Club, could you walk us through what exactly that is? All of our listeners are readers, all of them. Some of them are reading audiobooks, but they're readers. And um, some of our guests are authors. And we thought, man... There's just like this content connection that we can make through booking, through um, engaging with our audience in a in a different way, and we'd love to do it. Uh, when we launched Lemonada, it was always about content and community. And so we, we flirted with this late last year, um, launching the book clubs in sort of a pilot format and working with a publishing house who we love, Penguin Random House, for a few months to really understand what this might be. And now we're working exclusively with Apple Books um, to bring authors who are working with Apple onto Lemonada channels and then co-promoting. Um, so it's a cool it's a cool opportunity. We just had Carrie Washington on Sam B's show. I mean, it's like Carrie Washington is a great 
human being. She just wrote memoir. Memoir works really well with our audience because it's not dissimilar to listening to someone in a long form podcast and just hearing about their lives in particular ways. Um, and our hosts are excited because it's not just a PR op or a guest booking op. It's an op to like really dig in with an author in a particular way. So um, that's how we think about it. We think about it as an engagement tool, a community building tool. Um, and um, there's lots of other stuff going on behind the scenes as well. And yeah, I think um, just really bringing that community core value to light for us is, is big. Yeah. I come from the world of book publishing and I'm a big reader. And uh, so I've been like reading all the emails and texts that you guys send out. And I'm very jealous, to be honest, because uh, we we haven't had a plan for something similar that was like way further down the pipeline. But uh, I am uh, paying attention and, and you guys seem to be doing really cool stuff there. So congrats. Um, Thank you. And can you w walk us through the partner studio as well? Like, uh, did you guys just have a lot of people coming your way that wouldn't necessarily fit into another bucket? Yeah, we just launched a Lemonada partner studio. We we very decidedly from day zero are not a work for hire studio. So we've almost never done anything that was like someone coming to us and being like, can you make my podcast for me? Um, we, we made that decision because we wanted the business to thrive as a studio as a podcast business. We wanted our PML to make sense as a externally facing hit show network um, in the audio space and didn't want to have, you know, this situation where we were really having to do work for hire to pay the bills. Um, so early on experimentation was around like, how do we make shows that are great and profitable? It's like Venn diagram. Yeah. Real hard there, you know? That's that's the secret sauce. That's the secret sauce. <laughs> and that's what we've spent four years doing. Um, and, um, but you know, there's been, especially as our sort of brand has grown, there's been more and more incoming, like, can we, no, really, can we hire you to help us do this thing? Um, and so this year we experimented with a couple of projects, um, and now we're experimenting less is what I'd say. Um, but still, you know, we're taking on projects in a more for hire capacity when they make sense for us and we'd be the right network for it or the right group of people for it. Um, so mission aligned projects that we can actually handle that we're experts on. Um, so do not hire me to make your webcast. I will not do a good job. Well, we will still try. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I think it's such a fascinating idea, especially because you guys waited so long to do it um, for all the reasons that you just mentioned, but uh, it's such a core skill set that so many people don't have. And so you can kind of plug and play based on like what you're already doing so well. I mean, we're working with extraordinary people. I will say that. Like, it's it's amazing. It's like ridiculous. But, you know, people are like, hey, I have a, an idea and I wanted to hire someone to do it. And you might be the right people. And we're like, in this case, we think we are the right people. With the like general podcast market today, are you optimistic about kind of like, um, what's happening in the ad marketplace how do you feel right now generally about like the podcast economy i am so optimistic about audio um more and more people are listening to podcasting than ever every industry has to have go through growing pains and grow up a little bit and figure out you know you go from early stage media to and really emerging media in the last few years to um something that is more standard and all of these big hold codes at the agency level know what audio is. Audio budgets are becoming a more standardized part of every huge brand spend each year. So I'm super optimistic about that. Um, I heard a stat, so don't fact check this because this is just from my memory and I won't I won't name any brands, but a brand that spends about $4 billion a year on advertising is spending about 800,000 of that on audio right now. And that number will, and that percentage will continue to grow. Um, as people sort of understand the conversion in audio and know how to access listeners in a more strategic way, but it takes time. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's been a tough year for podcasting in, in some ways. Um, and I think, uh, the, the white knuckling is real and people trying to sort of persevere through some of the challenges and find ways to make it work is real. And I do think audio is here to stay for sure. Um, I think it's going to grow market share hugely. Um, 
And there's so much happening in media more broadly. Streaming is changing dramatically. Um, cable is changing dramatically. Linear radio is changing dramatically. And podcasting is just a big part of all of that. That's my favorite answer. Uh, I'm not even going to ask a follow-up because that's, it, that's exactly how I would have, have said that. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you again to Jess for joining us on the show today. You can check out everything that they are working on at LemonadaMedia.com. For more podcast-related news, info, and takes, you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Umbro. Podcast Perspectives is a production of The Podglomerate. If you are looking for help producing, distributing, or monetizing your podcast, you can find us at ThePodglomerate.com. Shoot us an email at listen at thepoglomerate.com or follow us on all social platforms at Poglomerate. This episode was produced by Chris Boniello and Henry Lavoy. And thank you to our marketing team, Joni Deutsch, Madison Richards, Morgan Swift, Annabella Penna, and Vanessa Ullman. And a special thank you to Dan Christo. Thanks for listening, and I will catch you next week. Hmm.